we're going to prove that if a sequence of non-negative numbers converges to a limit, then the square root of that sequence converges to the square root of that limit. Of course, since we're taking square roots, and this is real analysis, that's why every term of the sequence has to be at least zero, so that the square roots of the terms are real numbers. And we don't really have to specify that the limit x is non-negative because it's not possible for a non-negative sequence to converge to a negative number. So the limit x is definitely non-negative. And I definitely recommend trying to prove this yourself before watching the rest of the lesson. It's a pretty good medium difficulty exercise. If you want a couple hints to help you out, consider conjugates. The conjugate of an expression like a minus b is a plus b. My other hint is to consider zero on its own. With those hints, hopefully you're able to make some ground and maybe even prove it yourself. But now let's go through it together. Like any good convergent sequence proof, we'll begin with an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. We're assuming that our sequence of non-negative numbers xn converges to x, and we want to prove that the sequence of square roots, square root of xn, converges to the square root of that limit x. To do that, we'll need to show that the distance between the terms of our sequence, square root of xn, and the supposed limit, square root of x, will need this distance to be less than epsilon for all terms of our sequence after some big nth term. So we'll have to fill in the gap here to find the big n value that's going to make this work. Before we really start trying to make this expression less than epsilon though, there's something important we want to note. When we have two numbers being added or subtracted, and we'd much rather work with the squares of those numbers, we want to think about conjugates. Let's multiply this expression by its conjugate, which is the absolute value of the square root of xn plus the square root of x. So for the conjugate, we just flip the sign in the middle. In a previous lesson, we proved that the product of absolute values is the absolute value of the product, so we can just bring this multiplication into one pair of absolute value bars. So it is equal to the absolute value of the square root of xn minus the square root of x multiplied by its conjugate, square root of xn plus the square root of x. And I'll leave a link in the description to the lesson where we prove that the product of absolute values is the absolute value of the product. Now, why did we multiply by this conjugate? Well, what is this equal to? If we go through the multiplication, we'd have square root of xn times square root of xn, which is just xn. Then we'd have square root of xn times square root of x, but that would be canceled out by the minus square root of x times the square root of xn. So those middle terms would cancel out and all we'd be left with is minus square root of x times the square root of x, which is minus x. So that's why we multiplied by the conjugate. Now, instead of a difference of square roots, we have the difference of xn and x. This is wonderful, of course, because we can make this expression as small as we want, since we know that xn converges to x. Now, let's get rid of this middle step and see exactly how we'll use this. Of course, it's fine and dandy that this product is equal to this, but we're not interested in this product. We're interested in this expression. We want this to be less than epsilon. So let's solve this equation for this expression. To do that, we'll divide both sides by this. Dividing both sides by this gives us this equation. And now you can see, in order to show that this expression is less than epsilon, we can say this is equal to this, and then we can make this numerator as small as we need to. So, in the beginning of our proof, we might say, note that this equality is true. You could choose to not include this in your proof, but including it will make it more clear to the reader where this comes from. But before we dig into the details of finishing things up, there is an elephant in the room, which is the division that we did. We can't just divide by anything we please. Since we divided by this, we need to be sure that it's not equal to zero. 
If we know that our limit x is non-zero, then it must be positive, since, like we said, a sequence of non-negative numbers can't have a negative limit. So, again, if x isn't zero, it must be positive. Similarly, every xn being non-negative means that the square root of xn is non-negative. And so in total, if x is not zero, this denominator will definitely be positive, since it consists of a positive number being added to a non-negative number. However, although we know that x can't be negative, and I'll leave a link in the description to a lesson where we prove that, there is nothing stopping x from being equal to zero. This is possible. But in order for this to work, we need x to not equal zero. So what we'll do is assume for this proof x is not equal to zero, and then take care of the x equals zero case separately. So we'll add that note to the beginning of this proof, assume that x is not equal to zero. We'll finish this up and then we'll address the x equals zero case. Coming back here, we are working with our string of equalities and inequalities that we want to end with less than epsilon, so that we've shown this distance is less than epsilon. Like we said, we'll be able to make this numerator as small as we want, but it's a little tricky when we have terms of the sequence in the denominator. We'd like to get rid of that. We don't want the denominator to be changing based on n. Thankfully, we can get rid of it. For starters, like we've talked about, the square root of xn is non-negative, and the square root of x is positive, since we've assumed that x is non-zero, so these absolute value bars aren't doing anything. The denominator is positive with or without the absolute value bars. So this is equal to the same numerator, and then in the denominator, we can just drop those absolute value bars. Again, that's because both of these numbers are non-negative. Now, remember, we can always make a quotient bigger by making the denominator smaller. And in this case, we could make the denominator smaller by getting rid of this non-negative number, square root of xn. So certainly, this is less than or equal to itself, but without the square root of xn in the denominator. If xn equaled zero, which it could, then this would equal this, otherwise it would be less than it. Now we have a fixed number, square root of x, in the denominator, and we want to end with less than epsilon. So all we have to do is make this numerator smaller than epsilon times the square root of x. Let's move some of this stuff down to make room for our final note. Here's where we get the big n value. Since the sequence xn converges to x, we know that there exists a number, big N, so that the absolute value of xn minus x is less than epsilon times the square root of x for all n greater than big N. Notice again here, x not being equal to zero is important. Since xn converges to x, we can make this less than any positive number we please, but if x were zero, then this would be zero. Then, with the big N value in tow, we can say that for all terms of our sequence past the big nth term, the distance between them, the square root of xn, and the supposed limit, square root of x, is less than or equal to this, which is then less than itself, but with the bigger number, epsilon times the square root of x in the numerator. And then of course, shrinking this a little bit to make room for the final important thing, this is equal to epsilon. So we've proven if a sequence of non-negative numbers converges to a positive limit, then the square root of that sequence converges to the square root of that limit. Now we've just got to take care of the case when x is equal to zero. So we assume x equals zero, and we can just say that we're working with the same epsilon as before, just some arbitrary positive number. Then we're trying to show that this expression is less than epsilon, just like before, except this time the square root of x is the square root of zero, which is zero. And so this expression is simply equal to the absolute value of the square root of xn. 
The square root function gives the non-negative root, so this is a non-negative number, and so the absolute value bars aren't doing anything. So this is equal to the square root of xn. Now, this is still not something we can clearly control. We've assumed that xn converges to zero, so what we can control is the absolute value of xn minus its limit, zero. And this, of course, is equal to the absolute value of xn. And oh, that actually works out pretty nice because we've assumed every term xn is non-negative, thus they're equal to their absolute values. And so we can just throw some absolute values under the square root and consider the absolute value of xn. We can make this as small as we want. So how small should we make it? Well, we want this to be less than epsilon, so let's make the absolute value of xn less than epsilon squared. And there that is written out. Since our sequence xn converges to zero, we know there exists a number big N so that the distance between terms of the sequence xn and the limit zero, which is just the absolute value of xn, is less than epsilon squared for all n greater than big N. And so then we have for all n greater than big N, the distance between the square root of xn and the square root of x, which is just zero, is equal to the square root of the absolute value of xn, which is less than the square root of the bigger number, epsilon squared. And of course, the square root of epsilon squared is epsilon. And so we've shown that xn converging to zero implies that the terms of our sequence square root of xn are eventually less than epsilon away from zero. And so again we have that the sequence of square roots converges to the square root of the limit, which is in this case zero. And now we are completely done the proof. If a sequence of non-negative numbers converges to a limit x, then the square root of that sequence converges to the square root of x. And I'll remind you again, one of the subtle assumptions we made that I didn't write out is that the limit x has to be non-negative because a non-negative sequence can't converge to a negative limit. And again, I'll leave a link in the description to my video proving that. Let me know if you have any questions. Hey,